so first uh, for today, um, I would like to have uh, Janine Scott, who is the chair of uh, the board of CFA to give the welcome remarks. Thank you, Will, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world today. And thank you for taking time to be with us. We really are very, very privileged to have Ambassador Dr. John Kengazang with us as our keynote speaker this morning. He's a really good friend to CFA. As we know, Dr. Kengazang has been at the forefront of championing improvements in the overall health condition of people around the globe and especially on the African continent. And now we're embarking on the US Africa Leaders Summit in the coming weeks. And I think he'll be bringing us very useful and invaluable insights to, to US and to African leaders on the future of HIV policy and programs. As always, I'm sure that he will provide us with his additional wisdom today. Our panelists themselves are experts and practitioners and they'll lend their views to the ongoing HIV AIDS and other global health challenges in our discussions. Years ago, CFA was at the forefront of encouraging the US response to the HIV AIDS epidemic through the AIDS Marshall Plan that was championed by our past chairman, the late Honorable Congressman Dellums. This plan came to be known as PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, and as introduced by President George H.W. Bush. And as we know, it's still in effect today. CFA continues to engage with policymakers and practitioners and with a view to exert positive influence in this and other important areas of the health sector. And this is with the help and the guidance of those of, 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 of you, like uh, those like you who are with us today. Let me thank the CFA Health Infrastructure Committee, especially Dr. Gua for his work in bringing us together for this discussion this morning. I'd also like to thank our panelists for their time and contributions. And let me offer a special vote of thanks to our keynote speaker, Dr. Kengazang, for always responding to our call and for honoring us with his wisdom and for his tireless work on behalf of Africa and global health issues. With that, let me thank you all and turn it back to Will. Thank you very much, Janine. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead without much ado and gonna have my um, co-moderator for today, uh, Dr. Ali Landman, who is from The Lancet, to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Kengasan. Thank you so much, Will, and thanks for um, having me. Um, I'm Dr. Ali Landman from the Lancet Oncology, and it is my absolute privilege to introduce His Excellency Ambassador John, Dr. John Kengasong. He's the Global AIDS Coordinator in the Biden administration since 2022, this year. He previously worked as the Director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from 2016 uh, to 2022, as well as the at the World Health Organization and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Dr. John Kengasong was appointed to the WHO Special Envoy for Africa, and he's received many awards and honors, including U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services Award for Excellence in Public Health Protection Research, the CDC Foundation William Watson Medal of Excellence, the prestigious 500,000 Euro Virchow Prize for Global Health in 2022, and he was included in Time Magazine's 2021 Time 100 list of influential global figures where he was described as a modern day African hero for his role in the continent's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. John to um, go ahead and give his uh, keynote speech. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you so much. Let me, uh, I, I prepared a set of slides, but before I do that, let me um, just pose to thank CFA for the strong partnership encouragement that I personally have enjoyed since 2016 that I came in contact with the CFA. I remember uh, the event where CFA had organized an event at the um, AU consulate and uh, there were discussing there was a discussion around the Africa CDC and I woke up to Mel and whispered in his ear that 
the Africa CDC that they were discussing, I was going to be the director and he just, he went up in arms. I'm just uh, gathered people around immediately around me and it became um, uh, uh, really, I mean, people were just amazed. They didn't know what was going on. But um, he followed me through yeah, and accompanied me in the journey. He, he, when I launched the five year strategic plan for Africa CC in March of 2017, where Ashney, the, the gentleman on the, the, the right hand corner of this slide, and I had worked on that plan and released that in Addis Ababa, Mayor actually traveled from Washington, D.C. to uh, to uh, attend that session and give it uh, a blessing. And I think it was really, uh, at that time, Ethiopia uh, had witnessed a very bad landslide and that killed so many people. I think he left that meeting and went uh, to see that for, for himself. I think, and since then has always been there. When COVID hit, I was in Africa uh, leading the fight against COVID and it was very, welcoming and heartwarming that nearly every other Saturday or Sunday, uh, Will and Mir and others would join, uh, call me up to check how things were doing, encourage me. And I can't tell you how profound that was because the continent was at the crossroad of an existential threat where they were fighting a pandemic without diagnostics, without vaccines, without anything. And those words of encouragement were so warming and they were grounded. I started my days at 5 a.m. in the morning and closed at 11 p.m. at night and just struggling to find PPEs, diagnostics on the continent. So just calling me up to check how things were doing and what you could do was very, very heartwarming. So let me uh, come back to the HIV AIDS pandemic and perhaps make a few high level points. One is that um, HIV AIDS is still a pandemic. The second thing I would like to uh, state before I share with you the slides is that I believe strongly that uh, political sustainability has to be the underpinning for ability to drive the response to HIV AIDS, especially as we project to 2030, which is where we've all collectively agreed that we should make HIV AIDS less a public health threat. I say this because the success that we have all enjoyed thanks to HIV, uh, thanks to the programs like PEPFAR that uh, was mentioned here and the Global Fund have been remarkably effective, remarkably effective. But because of that, we don't see HIV AIDS in the streets anymore. We don't see it in the go to hospitals across the continent of Africa. You don't see HIV AIDS. You don't see the sad faces of HIV AIDS. But just because of that positive outcome, uh, the political leadership has, in my view, not uh, placed that way it has to be so that we can finish a fight against HIV AIDS. I think that is extremely important. So when we look at uh, the journey forward, uh, when I came on board in June, I was sworn in on the 13th of June, uh, I, I, I took time off to look at, uh, to listen to people, to actually create what we call a listening session. All the wise voices, all those who have been working in HIV AIDS. Remember, I've taken a break since 2016 to 2022 off to the continent. I was doing something other than HIV AIDS. So it was just but normal to come back and listen to people that have been on the forefront of fighting HIV AIDS. So what I'll present to you represents a reflection of many people that thought this is the, the strategic direction that we should take to bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2013. So Shinita, if you are kind enough to project the, the slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in the, the remaining minutes that I have, I would like to do three things. One, share for you the status of PEPFAR program and the PEPFAR strategy that I mentioned, and then conclude by looking at PEPFAR's partnerships, including a Go For That initiative. And you learn a little bit more about Go For That here. Next slide. So this slide summarizes for you uh, remarkable achievements that PEPFAR has uh, uh, recorded over uh, the course of 
it's uh, especially last year and some of the results are cumulative. And these results uh, speak to just the second quarter of 2022. If you look at the top panel of this graph, it tells you that 12 countries, high burden countries have reached or exceeded the 90-90-90 treatment targets. That is 90% of the people who are infected know their status, 90% are put on treatment, 90% have viral load suppressed, which is the hallmark for measuring the effectiveness of programs. The green dot there shows you that last year alone, PEPFA put close to 20 million women, men, and children on life-saving antiretroviral treatment. That is up by 17 point, uh, that is up from 17.2 million people that PEPFAR had put on ARV treatment in 2021. Cumulatively, that PEPFAR has recorded 5.5 babies born free from HIV AIDS due to PEPFAR investment, 5.5 million children born free of HIV AIDS. That 15 to 30% increase, we've seen a 15 to 30% increase in investments in vulnerable populations. The bottom part of this slide shows you some remarkable progress that was achieved during the, despite the COVID pandemic. PEPFAR renovate, innovated itself, and we saw a 480% increase in multi-month dispensation of life-saving ARVs. So instead of requiring people to come in every uh, week or every other day to get their drugs, the drugs were dispensed over several months, and that helped a lot that 4.3 million people were conducted self-testing for HIV. That represents a 200% increase from 2000 fiscal year 2019. And 2 million new clients were put on PrEP, uh, in, uh, compared that to only 300,000 in, uh, in 2020. So re really remarkable progress, thanks to preferred support. Next slide. The slide you see here shows you <clears throat> the resilience of the PEPFAR infrastructure and investments that we've, we put in place over the last couple of years. I would explain this slowly from, to, to you Or the, the vertical axis represents the number of individuals on, put on ARTs, and the horizontal axis here is the duration of the pandemic, starting from uh, March 4, 2020 to April 1, 2022. The, the, the peaks and the troughs there are the different waves and represent different countries. For example, South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, you can read the, the map, the, the, the legend on the right-hand side. But overall, it shows that despite the waves that we saw, the dotted line at the top panel of this shows you that the people that continue to receive ARTs very clearly early on, because of COVID, there, were this, there was a disruption, but because of the resilience of the HIV uh, PEPFA program, we continue to put people, even accelerated the number of people that were put on ARTs despite the multiple peaks. This speaks to the importance of having a resilience and the effect that PEPFA has put in place very strong health systems in countries that uh, we, we support. Next slide. This is a remarkable slide that was unthinkable a few years ago, and it speaks to the fact that countries, some countries have exceeded the 90-90-90, and they are now ex uh, progressing towards 95-95-95, which essentially says that country is striving to make sure that 95% of people who are HIV infected know their status, 95% of those people who know their status are put on treatment and 95% are on virus uh, 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 suppression. So you see countries like Botswana, Eswatini, Malawi, Lesotho, and Zimbabwe uh, making good progress, at least hitting one of the 95 squarely. We couldn't have imagined this a, a few months, a few years ago. Next slide. <clears throat> Despite those remarkable uh, progress, uh, the UNAIDS recently published a report, and this was in July, where they characterized the state of the pandemic, like 
the response of the state of the pandemic like uh, being in, in, in danger, that the response was in danger. Why did they say so? Let me walk you backward. Uh, in two, uh, UNAID had projected that by 2025, we should be having less than 1 million uh, new cases of HIV. But if you look at this curve carefully, the dark line, if the trajectory continues, you clearly, next slide, please, just hit that. You clearly will not, you'll be flying past that 2025 target, as you can see in the dotted hash line there, just because some of the challenges are due to the disruption that COVID created over the last two years. And some of the challenges are also due to the complacency that we are beginning to see in the response against HIV AIDS. In fact, more than 35 countries uh, UNAIDS is reporting that more than 35 countries are seeing an increase in number of new cases, which is very unfortunate. Next slide. So what is our strategy to respond to this? If you recall, I said slide, uh, when I came on board, uh, my top priority was to do a listening session, and we did quite a, a an extensive number of that, and especially took advantage of the AIDS conference in Montreal to meet with partner countries, meet with partners. Uh, the bottom part of this slide shows me with the Minister of Health of uh, South Africa and a series of other consultations that we had at the IAS. Next slide. This slide shows you uh, a five-year strategic direction. Uh, released at the UN General Assembly with several ministers of her from Rwanda, Botswana, Cote d'Ivoire, and other places, our partners, UNAIDS, Global Fund, and France, all join us in that. Everybody was very excited with that plan. Next slide. So what is the purpose statement of this plan? I think after seven weeks or eight weeks of listening, we said the purpose statement should be that we accelerate the response to end HIV AIDS pandemic as a public health threat by 2030. Keyword here is accelerating the response while sustainably strengthening public health systems that could enable us to fight other infectious diseases. I, we continue to uh, believe that we have to reimagine the strategic direction that we're going with is uh, with, to, to get us to 2030. As a, uh, there's a book that I always like to read, and I've read that book several times, which says, what brought us to this point will not take us to the next point. So we should continue to uh, uh, um, uh, work very hard and, and be innovative. Next slide. <clears throat> but to do that, we agreed on a core set of principles that the PEPFAR strategic direction with reimagining where we are heading to 2030 should be guided by five core principles, respect and humility. Humility in the lens of saying, well, it's not much about thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less and knowing that there are things we don't know and knowing that there are partners, countries that we can learn from, equity accountability and transparency, impact and sustained engagement. PEPFAR has been, is characterized or owes a lot of the respect because of the accountability, transparency and impact that it has enjoyed over the last close to 20 years. Next slide. So this slide shows you the five pillars and three enablers, what we are calling the five by three. First pillar is to know your gaps and close those gaps. We're calling it health equity for priority populations. And I would expand into some of those or all of the pillars shortly. Second is sustaining the response. The third pillar deals with public health systems and health security. The fourth pillar is on transformative partnerships. And the last pillar is following the science. We recognize that there are certain things that are cross-cutting up with all these pillars. They include community leadership, innovation, and leading with data. 
Next slide. <clears throat> so let me then spend a few minutes per uh, uh, pillar. So the first pillar, we recognize that based on the evidence that we have, that we need to scale up our interventions in three priority populations, adolescent girls and young women, children, and key populations. So what is the evidence supporting this? In Sub-Saharan Africa, 52% of new infections occurred in this category, that is amongst adolescent girls and young, young women, despite this population representing 24% of the population. That only 57% of children living with HIV AIDS are receiving ARVs compared to 80% or more of adults. And that in key population, often globally, more than 70%, they represent 70% of new infections. So that is the evidence that guided us to focusing on these populations going forward. Next slide. Then we look at public health system and, and sec uh, uh, security. What we, we mean here by security is health security. And the key question we, we've been having to toy with is how do we leverage PEPFAR uh, platforms to respond more broadly to other public health threats? And we are looking at several areas of interest in red. Strengthening national public health institutions, modernizing supply chains, robot integrated health workforce, lab data and surveillance systems, regional manufacturing of commodities and public health, uh, uh, and public health for people living with HIV AIDS. That is looking at a patient center approach in supporting uh, people that have been infected with HIV AIDS or are living with HIV AIDS. For instance, we now know that about 20% of the population that we support have a, a hypertensive, what do we do? There are issues of mental health. So that those are new areas that we need to support. We also know that the PEPFAR platforms are being leveraged as we speak in fighting Ebola in Uganda. Have you been used in Africa in fighting monkeypox and COVID-19? So that is what we mean by being very intentional in supporting public health systems and, and health security infrastructure architecture. Next slide. This slide just shows you some of the, on the left-hand side, some of the advances that I, I indicated earlier. But on the right-hand side, it also shows how the PEPFA platforms were leveraged in supporting the COVID response, including rolling out of uh, the COVID tests, um, deployment of healthcare workers for vaccinations, infection control prevention, collection of data, and delivery of, of PPE to several countries that PEPFA had assets. Next slide. Next slide, please. So transformative partnership. We recognize that we have to look at partnerships from several lenses. One is what kind of relationship PEPFA should have with global institutions, regional institutions like the African Union, Africa CDC, philanthropic organizations, and the private sector. And if you look at what is going on on the continent of Africa right now, there's a lot of private sector interest in her because they recognize that a disease threat is a straight, uh, has a direct impact and a straightforward impact on uh, uh, economic health and security. The, Afri uh, the African Development Bank has actually allocated more than 3 billion uh, or is planning to invest almost 3 billion to supporting health infrastructure on the continent. How do we partner with such an organization to and create synergies and leverage what they are producing? So these are new areas that we are ready to explore and not just partnerships that are um, US driven, but partnerships that also originate from the continent of Africa. Next slide. So let me, as I move to my conclusion, focus a little bit on partnerships and just uh, use that as an illustration of what is possible if we apply our minds uh, uh, appropriately. Next slide. 
one of the partnerships that um several partnerships are out there and we can pick any of these and expand on it. The Dreams Initiative is really focused on adolescent girls, has been going on for, for uh, so long. The Men's Stars Coalition, the Go For The, the Project Last Mile and, and others. But let me just uh, look at uh, the Go, Go, Go For The uh, partnership. Next slide. This is a partnership that is, was designed to end in HIV AIDS and cervical cancer. And it's really, um, Goal was reducing cervical cancer cases by 95% amongst women living with HIV in 12 partner countries. And the results are indicated on the right hand side. More than 4.3 million cervical cancer screenings in 12 countries have occurred. 82% or 3.6 million of these were first time uh, screens. 74% of identified uh, precancerous lesions have been treated, resulting in a total of 224,000 treatment provided. Remarkable partnership. And those involved are indicated at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the PEPFA is there, of course, the George W. Bush uh, Center is a big uh, uh, supporter and, and champion of this, UNAIDS, Merck, and Roche. So it is extremely, uh, it's a very powerful intervention. These are the kind of partnerships that I'm looking forward to establishing to addressing hypertension, establishing addressing uh, um, uh, mental health uh, uh, issues uh, amongst uh, the HIV AIDS population. Next slide. Several other areas of collaboration exist. For example, regional manufacturing and supply chain. How can we develop partnerships with the US uh, 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 philanthropies, private sector to encourage manufacturing, such that when we have another pandemic, say in Africa or a disease outbreak, we do not uh, uh, get into uh, a, a shouting match as we did last time, where the north and south there was a north-south divide, where developing countries were accusing developed countries for uh, 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 taking all the vaccines or diagnostics, which. Um, uh, is all due to scarcity. Less scarcity not continue to be uh, the promoter of inequity. Digital health, wo health workforce, patient-centered approaches, health security, and priority populations, those are all areas that offer themselves for effective partnerships, just as the one I've shown for the cancer uh, um, uh, treatment and screening. Next slide. So let me pause here and, and open this up for a discussion. I just wanted to use this to say that as the continent, the, the, the continent of Africa leadership gathered in Washington mid-December, we should remember that, yes, what is in people's start now is COVID, but we should remember that we still have a pandemic going on, which is HIV AIDS, and use all avenues and all uh, uh, touch points to make sure that we continue to highlight that and make sure that the head of states who will be here understand that we need to uh, uh, reset the button and finish the fight against HIV AIDS. Otherwise, the gains that have been made over the years will be completely uh, 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 wasted and eroded. And HIV AIDS, just to end my reflection, is a generational uh, disease now. The young people who are out there now just didn't see HIV AIDS. They didn't see it the way we saw it. So uh, it's history to them that when you tell them that they are at risk, they don't think, they don't see themselves at, at risk because they have hardly seen an HIV AIDS patient in, in a hospital. So because of that, again, it has driven the issues uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to the back burner a little bit. So again, uh, we should really uh, be, uh, make sure that we, we, have, we bring that forcefully to the fore of our conversations at the leadership summit. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, John. That was that was wonderful. Thank you for that educational talk and uh, sharing those perspectives and your vision. Uh, we're very excited about this. And I actually wanted to say that uh, the last part, maybe we'll start where you, you ended on the Go Further initiative. There's been a lot of people talking about, uh, we launched the Lancet Oncology Commission recently in Africa, and there's a big, big, um, Big pan, I mean, crisis there as well. And so it's really wonderful to see that you mentioned the Go Further initiative. And I also know that as we think about the US Africa Summit, um, Dr. Katherine Young at the White House has been working really hard to kind of bring that uh, as one of the issues on, on cancer. So she's here to, with us today, and I would like um, 
to, to facilitate that discussion, to give a chance to for her to also um, make a response on this, to talk a little bit about that. And uh, for that, I'm gonna ask uh, Ali to introduce Dr. Young uh, to make a few remarks. Sure, thanks, Will. So for um, remarks, response, and discussion, we have um, Dr. Catherine Young. She is the Assistant Director for Cancer Moonshot Engagement and Policy in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And her focus on cancer began um, when she served as the Senior Director of Science Policy at the Biden Cancer Initiative, and then as Executive Director of a Rare Cancer Advocacy Organization. So she has a long history and understanding needs of cancer control. So please go ahead, Dr. Young. Oh, I think you're on mute. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that introduction. It's really an honor to be here with you all this morning. Um, and I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the Global Health Catalyst Summit and uh, uh, CFA for extending this invitation and including me in this really important discussion this morning. I would also like to extend my gratitude for Ambassador Kangasong for your leadership and your dedication to improving the health and well-being of the world's most vulnerable people. And we look forward to deepening our relationship with both you and PEPFAR. And it's especially exciting for me uh, to be here before you today because I am someone who for the first 18 years of my life grew up in sub-Saharan Africa and through the twists and turns of life, I am now being reconnected to it in my capacity as um, of serving as the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Assistant Director for the Cancer Moonshot. And because of this, I will be using my time with you this morning, sharing more about the Cancer Moonshot, our commitment to broadening our global portfolio, um, particularly as it relates to Africa. In 2016, then Vice President Biden began an effort to double the rate of progress against cancer, a goal to which so many, both here in the United States and throughout the global cancer community, responded with passion, ingenuity, and commitment. Paul the Cancer Moonshot, the work he led in the final year of the Obama-Biden administration led to the launch of new programs, policies, and collaborations from all sectors, actions that address the patient experience from diagnosis through survivorship. Importantly, it led to many major global collaborations like that of the International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium at the National Cancer Institute, now spanning 14 countries and 33 member institutions, a network of leading cancer and proteogenomic research centers across the globe that represent importantly the diversity of people and of all cancers around the world. When now President Biden returned to office, he wanted to supercharge the work and bring his leadership and a whole of government effort back to the cancer moonshot. That's why in February, President Biden reignited the cancer moonshot to transform hope into action and set two new goals, to reduce the death rate by cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years, and to improve the experience of people, their families and caregivers living with and surviving cancer. In addition to these new goals, the president also identified areas of priorities. He has often said that he wants to end cancer as we know it. We took that statement and we defined specifically how we know cancer today, which really transcends many diseases. Too often a patient receives a diagnosis too late. We have too few tools or do too little to prevent. We have stark inequities in diagnosis, access to treatment and trials, and to healthy outcomes. We still know too little about how to target treatment to patients. We still lack good strategies to develop treatments, especially those for rare and childhood diseases. We leave most patients and caregivers to navigate the disease and its aftermath, including survivorship, on their own. And we don't learn enough from the experiences of most patients. But these challenges are not unique to the United States, and certainly we share them with most countries across the world. And so the urgency to address them is paramount. We know that in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, with a population exceeding 1.1 billion people, that without effective interventions, the number of deaths from cancer will exceed 1 million per year by the year 2030. 
This is not news to many of you, but this is unacceptable. To see real change happen, we must come together as one to tackle some of the greatest and shared priority areas with combined efforts. And while the immediate goals for the cancer moonshot are domestic in their foundation, the ambitions of the cancer moonshot extend far beyond the United States. An important part of the goal is ensuring that more people have access to the tools we already have to prevent and combat cancer. And we recognize that the burden of cancer falls heavily to those in lower and middle income countries. This is particularly important when we consider that the brunt of the HIV epidemic is also borne by low and middle income countries. And while HIV doesn't seem to cause cancer directly, we know that over time it causes the immune system to become weaker, putting people living with HIV at an increased risk of many types of cancer. In addition, people living with HIV who are diagnosed with cancer are more likely to die from that cancer than people without HIV. It's also why our partners like the National Cancer Institute and USAID have a keen focus on lower and middle income countries, particularly as it relates to strengthening screening, expanding HPV vaccine access, and building research capacity around HIV-related cancers. It's also why we are so excited about the potential synergies that lay with PEPFAR initiatives focused around HIV-related cancers. Because when it comes to the cancer moonshot, it means taking this opportunity, building on this momentum to combine efforts across governments, civil society, and the global cancer community to make real progress on ending cancer as we know it. Many barriers remain, but there is no doubt that the future of oncology lies with global collaboration and capitalizing on the tools, resources, and most importantly, the will to see change happen. And so I'd like to end where President Biden and the First Lady so often start, with hope. And I don't have to tell this audience that we don't mean hope in the abstract. We mean hope grounded in science, hope grounded in quality care, hope grounded in keeping families together, hope represented by every survivor around the world. You have our commitment to make significant progress together. Thank you so much for your time this morning and this opportunity to be here. And with that, Will, I will turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Katherine. I mean, it's wonderful to always hear you speak very passionately about this. Also having been spending the 18 years of your life in Africa, I can understand the passion. Um, but I think the, the you, you, and, you and Ambassador John, you are really uh, great leaders in trying to see how we can address this issue um, of health access in Africa. And so now, um, Ambassador John, I would like to kind of get your response to this, because that's a lot of the questions that are coming up. It's about, you know, we know about 1 million deaths in cancer by 2030. And like um, Dr. Young mentioned, uh, cervical cancer is actually one of the leading causes of cancer death. And you've talked about that on your paper, a Go For The Initiative. So how do you see potential synergies with the cancer moon chart? So the, um, what PEPFAR has provided all of us is a unique platform for uh, implementation and rolling out of, of, of uh, any interventions, right? I think we should always, uh, in public health, remember uh, and be prepared to address what I usually call the value of death where imagine the moonshot comes out with uh, any good interventions. And then on the other hand, you don't have deliveries for that. I think it becomes meaningless. I think we have seen how often that uh, we believe that because you have a new intervention and a, a, a product that automatically means that you get those products to the best side. It's not the case. As we speak, uh, on the continent of Africa, let me just use uh, uh, the, COVID, the present COVID-19 pandemic to uh, weaponize this ag argument. Uh, only less than 25% of the population of 1.3 billion people in Africa have been effectively vaccinated. That is at least two shots of I mean, COVID. And the, the vaccines are there, right? Vaccines, we have vaccines now, surplus COVID vaccines are out there. There are many factors that speak to that, but the number one factor is the infrastructure, the architecture that is available to roll out those interventions, that is the nurses, 
the the system, the transport systems, uh, hospital systems, and whatever. So PEPFA has offered that. PEPFA has trained over three hundred thousand healthcare workers on the continent of Africa, and in my new strategy, I hope to expand that for, to for uh, more nurses and community healthcare workers. Right. So that is an avenue there. PEPFA has supported more than seventy thousand. At, at, at health facilities across uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And PEPFA has strengthened more than 3,000 laboratories across, across sub-Saharan Africa. So those are all infrastructures that whatever intervention occur in the cancer at, 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 at arena, it can be translated easily, can be rolled out very, very easily. Otherwise, the, 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 that new product or innovation becomes completely irrelevant. Uh, to to the population there, so I think that is the kind of partnerships that we mean. And the the pillar, the pillar number three on public health system is what I'm referring to. That we should intentionally protect that, leverage that, so that or prepare so that it can use that assets in rolling out any public health interventions there, and so that we begin to move away from multiple silos of interventions in in Africa, but consolidate what PEPFA has used has established so far in, in uh, different countries. That will be a critical partnership once you start having those uh, uh, um, uh, uh, interventions available. Thank you, John. Any comments, Catherine, on that? Just to say, Ambassador King of Song, uh, completely agree with everything that you just mentioned. The health system infrastructure and the workforce development is, is really key parts of how we how we think about supporting lower and middle income countries, as you mentioned, having the technologies and the tools and resources are really useless if we are un unable to get them to the people who need them the most. And, and really, that is one of our key priority areas for the Cancer Moonshot. So I appreciate those remarks, and we certainly look forward to working more with you on this issue. Yeah, great. I mean, that's wonderful to, to, to imagine that, um, you know, definitely the collaboration can make us really go further, uh, like John mentioned in that presentation. So um, I'm going to quickly, since we, uh, you know, matter issue, because of time considerations, I'm going to let uh, Adi um, introduce the, oh, Mel, I see your hand is up. Do you have a question that's burning? You're on mute. Okay, so Mel, while you're trying to figure that out, I think uh, uh, Ali, maybe you want to introduce the next panelist who can ask a question or comment on John's presentation. Sure, I believe next to speak is um, Dr. Your James, who's a board certified general surgeon, also certified by the American Society of Transplant Surgery and Kidney and Pancreas Trans Transplantation, and she currently practices in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the USA. She was motivated to pursue a career in medicine and international relations due to experiences that she had growing up in Nigeria. She's also a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, president of the Nigerian Physicians Advocacy Group, and co-chairs the board of the Nigerian Diaspora Political Affairs Committee. So please go ahead, Dr. James. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon from Lagos, Nigeria. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. And you know, there are always network issues. So if I start to sound funny, just let me know so I can turn off my video. Uh, but uh, hello, everyone. I want to thank uh, CFA uh, for putting this event together. And thank you, Mel, for the invite to give my thoughts on how uh, to strengthen US-Africa collaborations in health. Um, I've already been introduced. I'm a surgeon and will be speaking primarily from a Nigerian context since this is um, what I best know about. So first, I want to thank, um, congratulate uh, Ambassador at Large, um, uh, John Akekuso, for his 2022 uh, Vaco Prize in Global Health. Congratulations, sir. Um, so I read uh, with great interest the publication, Reimagining PEPFAR's uh, Strategic uh, Direction, uh, Fulfilling Americans' Promise to End HIV AIDS Pandemic by 2023. Um, and you have highlighted um, some of the, uh, the content of, of that publication in your presentation uh, this afternoon or morning. <laughs> There's no doubt uh, of PEPFA's successes. Uh, I think PEPFA continues to exemplify uh, the caring nature of most American people. Um, I would like to discuss some uh, opportunities for greater impact, specifically 
um, as it relates to Nigeria. So it's been mentioned uh, by the two speakers that functional healthcare system um, is needed to effectively combat any epidemic or pandemic. Um, and in current times, we have seen this with HIV, Ebola, and COVID-19. And we are wise to, to be preparing for the next uh, epidemic and, and pandemic. However, uh, Nigeria, like most sub-Saharan -Sub African uh, countries, have healthcare system that remains mostly dysfunctional. Uh, the primary healthcare systems are weak. Uh, good quality care is mostly unaffordable. And there's a general distrust for medical professionals, most of whom are leaving the country uh, because they are overwhelmed and quite frankly, do not have most resources needed to adequately care for patients, including clean water. Um, in Nigeria, for example, it is estimated that 40 doctors and 150 nurses emigrate to the West weekly. And this is a disaster. Um, available records indicate that Nigerians spend between 1.2 and $1.6 billion on medical tourism annually. Uh, many Nigerian policymakers get their care abroad. Um, and I've personally received referrals from, from patients who reside um, in Nigeria. So I think that um, the healthcare crisis in Nigeria obviously is no fault of PECFA or the US government, uh, but rather a broken system uh, that is directly related to significant gaps in governance. So therefore, in order to strengthen US, Africa, Nigerian collaborations in health, the governance problem must be addressed with top priority. And can everyone still hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, you know, there are standards that uh, must be set by appropriate body on healthcare spending. For example, in 2001, uh, during the Abuja declarations, a lot of these uh, members of the African Union were supposed to increase their healthcare spending to 15% of the budget, uh, while Western um, countries increase support. I think that the US and other Western countries have fulfilled a lot of that support. However, in Nigeria, for example, the budget is still, uh, the, the healthcare budget for health still lingers at three to four four percent. In fact, the Nigerian government made cuts to health and education during the COVID-19 pandemic. I, uh, an organization that I lead in addition to 11 other Nigerian healthcare organizations in Nigeria and outside Nigeria petitioned the government about this, but obviously got no response. So is there a way that the Nigerian government can actually invest in the healthcare infrastructure so that programs like PEPFA and you know uh, what the lady mentioned uh, earlier can even be more effective. So you know, sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa has a lot of depend dependency on foreign aid, uh, with proliferation of NGOs and resultant um, donor dependency syndrome. And please do not understand, do not misunderstand, this foreign aid help individuals, but really has done little to improve the healthcare system as a whole. I am encouraged by PEPSA's strategy to strengthen public health systems, to strengthen leadership, um, training, and sustainability, sustainability. But I would propose that there should be further collaborations with strong Nigerian American diaspora healthcare organizations that for work in Nigeria, because there is a special cultural knowledge that these organizations bring. So for example, the organization that I belong to, the Association of Nigerian Physicians in the Americas, this is a 501c3 charitable organization that is committed to improving healthcare system in Nigeria. A lot of the work we do in Nigeria is from our uh, personal sacrifice, time, finances, um, doing things to really help our, our homeland. And, and this uh, group of physicians were all Nigerian Americans uh, across different disciplines, including medicine, infectious diseases, pediatrics, um, gynecology, obstetrics, and surgical specialties. A lot of us have really done well in our respective disciplines in the state, and many of us have global uh, healthcare experience. Um, and I just want to end with this. Finally, you know, there is upcoming elections in Nigeria scheduled for March and um, in February and March of 2023. Uh, most Nigerians desire and seek change um, that will bring about security, uh, that will bring about good healthcare, um, that will bring about leadership that actually can invest in the people. Um, a lot of people are concerned about the deteriorating healthcare system. I am in Lagos right now on a Doctors for Change uh, convention where we're discussing how do we 
as you know, doctors in diaspora of Nigerian descent help build the system. And the concern, the, the one constant is that the infrastructure, the governing principles and all that is just not sound to be effective to do what we need to do. Um, so, uh, you know, and again, it's not my personal opinion, it's just the fact of the matter. Um, there have been multiple attacks on offices um, of the Inter Independent National Electoral Commission. This is the body that is geared to allow to conduct free and fair elections. Uh, these people are being attacked, uh, uh, permanent voters' cards are being destroyed. Uh, and without that, you know, people in Nigeria are unable to vote. So if Nigerians are not allowed to elect the leaders that can invest in their health um, without fear and intimidation, I don't see how uh, U.S. Uh, Nigerian collaboration to improve the healthcare system can really be strengthened. I mean, yes, we may be able to fix things here, here and there. You know, I always use the analogy: put the bandaid on the wound. I'm a surgeon, so if if you don't, you can put your finger on the bleeding vessel. But if you don't sew up that hole, I mean, eventually the patient is going to sanguinate. Um, you know, um, so. I, I, so like I said, you know, I don't see how that can happen without threatening, without fixing the, the governance issue. Um, it will essentially uh, equate to doing the same thing over again and expecting the same result. Simply stated, it will equate to insanity. And I thank you for taking the time to listen to me uh, today and would be very interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Uh... So John, do you want to come? I know you mentioned the sustainability that government is really important. You have those during your talk. Maybe you you have some response to that in terms of U.S. Africa countries. Oh, thank thank you, um, Dr. James. Uh, is your, is is your last name right? Yeah, James is my last name. I'm married to an all American. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, Dr. James. I just wanted to be sure that. Um, uh, it's a better name than King Asan, which uh, I think 95% of people don't get to pronounce it. So uh, <laughs> of that. So, uh, wow, <clears throat> wow, this is this is loaded. And let me trade that uh, by respond very carefully so that I do not um, uh, uh, intrude into Nigeria's uh, 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 issues. I think maybe Mel can help uh, address. Um, he's he has a broader view on Africa than I do. But let me just um, say this that. Um, respond at three levels and, and start with something that is within our reach. What, what can we do very practically? I think I'll take your offer that, about the diaspora, uh, pro Nigerian diaspora program and say that uh, in the coming weeks, after the holidays, let's meet in Washington. Uh, Shinita is on this call and uh, Ashni, uh, 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 my senior uh, 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 advisor for strategy and Shinita is the senior uh, uh, the senior advisor, let them coordinate with you and we have a meeting in Washington so that we can sit down and see what is possible with that Nigerian diaspora 501c group that I mean. So let's start with what is possible within, uh, uh, and then explore, sit down and think, look through our strategy and see where, which areas of interest we can focus on. Uh, we can work together, create partnerships. I mean, the, I think that is level within our, our scope. Second is that, um, I like your, you mentioning the 2001 Abuja Declaration and picking up on that and working with the AU to have a meeting of head of state at the sideline of the African Union Summit to say, 20 years ago, you met in Abuja and issued the declaration, where are we, with, where are we with? I mean, and a lot has happened in 20 years. So what can we do uh, in, in, the, in terms of recommitting ourselves to that, that declaration. It's not a new declaration. Luckily, people like President Obasanjo are still there. I want to bring him on board and let us let him governize other head of states so that they will visit that. So I think watch out for the uh, AU summit in February. Thirdly, is that PEPFA has invested close to a little bit above $100 billion in the last 19 years in uh, supporting HIV AIDS response and 90% of that or even more has been in sub-Saharan Africa. And it has really helped revamped the, the health system and infrastructure. I can name so many, the Wuzu Hospital in Nigeria, so many others that I mean, infrastructure that you and I know, but 
PEPFA would never replace national governments in Africa. I mean, PEPFA can only do what it can do. Um, and so the, the, the sustaining the response component of our strategy is really saying we can, we have to hold hands together, national governments and the U.S. support so that we can actually have a lasting impact on health system. Yeah, so I think that is, uh, that, that is very obvious. The PEPFA program in Nigeria is doing very well. I mean, congratulations on the leadership that Nigeria has shown in moving PEPFA. Is, it has now emerged as one of those uh, uh, shining examples of a good performance. And I look forward to coming to Nigeria to see that firsthand. The ambassador uh, uh, in Nigeria, the US ambassador in Nigeria has been inviting me like her to come in there, but so many things have been holding me down. I really look forward to going to Nigeria to see that that, uh, that performance there. So I think, um, and lastly, I'll just say that um, the issues you raised about um, Nigeria committing its own resources are actually uh, the, the, the right issues and the right concerns. And that is where sustainability will come from. And uh, partners can only do what they can do as partners. And this is not only for Nigeria, but across the board, including in my own country of birth, Cameroon. I mean, I say the same thing. I, I just spent the last six years in Ethiopia. I say the same thing to the leadership there, Minister Leia and others have said, we as partners can come in and support, but it will always be the government uh, taking the heart of their own people central in their developmental agenda. We now know that hurt is development. We now know that hurt is economics. We now know that hurt is security. So if governments have to have a, a forward leaning dialogue, investment in hurt becomes very, very critical. So I think, I mean, I can agree more with your comments, but again, uh, just to end, uh, let, I, I take you on your offer. Let's sit down in Washington at some point after the holidays and just brainstorm and see what is possible with them um, for the 501 uh, organization that uh, you are a member of in Nigeria. Oh, thank you, John. That's wonderful. I mean, I think that's something that Dr. James should really take up on that offer. Um, so looking at the time, I know we started a little late. I would say uh, we'll give one more chance to um, Mikaelin uh, or Damash, uh, who was supposed to be one of the next uh, was a question or comment. So Ali, maybe you just introduce her quickly and just be very brief, Mikaelian, please, because- uh, okay. you're right. I'm sorry, I just to say real quick, I, I appreciate it, I look forward to meeting you in, in DC. I return back to the state on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, so finally, we have Mikaelian Holder March, who's a healthcare executive with over 31 years of leadership and training experience and is currently um, Executive Director of Operations, System Resilience and Nursing at one of the UK's biggest NHS providers. So please go ahead, um, Mrs. Holder-Marsh. Okay, hi, thank you very much. Um, Ambassador John Kersong, I want to say congratulations on your appointment and to everyone here. I, I am the leader of Health and, um, Health and Tech, which is hosted in Ghana. And it's so refreshing to hear what Dr. James was saying, because one of the things that just came out of our recent seminar, where I had people from all over the world, doctors from all over the world, is about intersectoral collaboration and prevention programs and how we can actually invest in that um, and use an IT along, alongside that and improve in research and really get our people to participate in clinical trials. But the other thing in regards to the HIV ambassador, I just really want us to really push IPC, infection prevention control, really push it from schools, really starting really at the grassroots because we still see in hospitals and rural areas still using needles that haven't been properly sterilized. And that's because lack of resources and it's not all hospitals, but I think we really need to go back to the basics um, in regards to that and anything that, that I could do in actually helping in any way, as well as um, directing to some of the, the really amazing people who participated in the Leaders Health and Tech who are doing incredible um, advancement across Africa. I think it would be really great to get them on board to actually have a conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mikaelin. Uh, Ambassador Kengasa, do you have any? No, I mean, just to say, I fully agree. IPC is central to uh, any, uh, if you look at what we did uh, during the early days of COVID, 
and uh, uh, I mean, they, 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 if I recall some of the five things that that I promoted uh, or championed with early days of COVID in in Africa was at IPC. Well, I mean, with rank top. I remember when we had uh, the COVID just uh, erupted, and in Nigeria, uh, the, we had an IPC workshop uh, led by Dr. Chikwe when the first cases uh, showed up in Nigeria. So those team, the team that I had in Nigeria was redeployed to supporting um, the Nigeria response, but it was an IPC because most of these things are IPC related. So I think that is yeah. just uh, obvious. I think that's, um, uh, but you know, uh, there's really no glory in prevention. So that is, uh, there's glory in treatment. So if uh, Dr. James <laughs> is so when you treat people, you have a, a, a grateful clearance and they could turn around, but when you prevent things, people don't even know that you have, you have saved millions of lives. But so that's exactly. the challenge with the, the, the IPC, just like in prevention in HIV AIDS, why is treatment more renowned in HIV AIDS than prevention? I mean, because yeah. when you put someone on treatment who was suffering and they, 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 they they, they, they rise up and they start moving and they promote that. Whereas prevention is that. So again, it's something that we need to champion continuously. So that prevention gets the same glory as treatment. So it's just uh, the, the, the challenge that public health faces all the time. I definitely will be borrowing your words. I think it's very profound. There's no glory in prevention. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you so much. I mean, we had to have a Q&A, but I think we run out of our time. So I'm going to let... Uh, maybe one question you can ask from the q a chart and then we'll have uh ambassador john answer that and then Mel will and, and i really have to i really have to go please because i'm eating into other other time sorry but we started okay, all right so i guess we'll have to wrap up then Mel. this yeah uh thank you very much dr and king uh, i don't think there's a person on the planet who knows more about african health than you do and i felt that when i first met you and i still feel that way uh, you know, I'm the least qualified person on this call to talk about health or anything. No PhD behind my name or no MD. But uh, when I think about healthcare in Africa, I'm thinking about water, sanitation. I'm thinking about malaria. I'm thinking about climate change, which is moving people around the continent like you wouldn't believe. Uh, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, I think the U.S. government is going to have to say something at the summit. The Africans are grumbling, saying all we do is talk and we don't have the action. You know, we don't see the uh, the billion dollar things that China is throwing out on the table. We don't see what other countries are putting on the table. And so I think people are going to be looking for us to take a sort of moonshot to address the healthcare dilemma in Africa. And I don't I know if you want to say something about that, because people are going to be looking at that summit and say, OK, what is the U.S. government going to do? Are we just going to talk? You know, 80 percent of the people in Africa live in rural areas. They don't live in Accra or Lagos or Johannesburg, they live in rural areas with limited access to healthcare infrastructure whatsoever. So my question would be, uh, what what are the, what is the U.S. government uh, planning to do? Is there going to be an announcement at the summit? I also want to extend a warm greeting on behalf, behalf of Dr. Roscoe Moore. He told me he was going to try to get on the call, but if he couldn't, he wanted me to say, to tell you hello and how much you appreciate all that you're doing. And I just want to thank um, all of the uh, participants on this call. And I want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. So, John, if you could say anything about any of that, I would be very appreciative. Thank you very much. No, th thank you so much. And let me say that um, I, I look forward to the summit with a lot of uh, uh, interest because uh, the f two things that I hope uh, we can achieve at the summit. One is that uh, as the leadership, the political leadership of the continent gathered to just say thank you for what the US government has done in the fight against HIV AIDS. Uh, next February will be 20 years of uh, a, a, a US government commitment. It's the largest bilateral program in the world in fighting a global health, a single disease. And it has had ripple effects across the continent. And before the PEPFAR started, life expectancy in many African countries have dropped by 12 years. Okay, now we 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 we, we uh, life expectancy is where it is, and now I'm shooting up um, because of of that. I think that is one. Second thing, I really hope that uh, the continent that leadership can do is to just say, please, please reauthorize PEPFAR next year. And I'm counting on CFA to use all your leverage points to say, 
please reauthorize that. Repepa invests the, uh, invest about $7 billion a year, okay, in the fight against HIV, including the $1.5 billion that goes to the Global Fund from, from Pepfa and then the rest for bilateral programs a year in fighting the single disease. If that is reauthorized next year, I have no reasons to believe that it, it would not be reauthorized. PEPFAR has always been a bipartisan pro, uh, program, but please, uh, CFA, join forces in talking to whoever you 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 have to talk to, so that the history of PEPFAR is interesting. A few weeks ago, I was down in Dallas to meet with President Bush, and we had a long and interesting conversation. And he said, Ambassador, uh, you have to work hard so that you in educate, inform the new uh, uh, people on the hill, because a lot of people out there, if you tell them about PEPFA, they think it's toothpaste, uh, end of quote. I think they you joke, you laugh. I mean, I mean, and, and I said, he said, because 80% of the people that were there initially when he started PEPFA are gone, okay, and they, they probably don't even know what it is and what it has done. So I'm hoping that I'll be part of uh uh, the, a Cordell uh, congressional delegation in February to, that is going to go visit Africa, see that first time and bring some new uh, con uh, Congress uh, people and senators together to see what is happening in Africa. So again, just to say that why asking for more, uh, which is uh, for the US to invest more in health in Africa, but to consolidate what we have already. What we have already is prepped and is coming to the reauthorization next year. And if we should just imagine if it's not reauthorized, what will happen to the million of people that are on treatment in, in Africa and what has happened in terms of lifting the infrastructure, health infrastructure on the continent. So that those are two points that I'd like to, 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 to make. So I think the only thing I also say is that uh, the US government, uh, sh uh, now that I'm part of the administration, I think I'll be working out to make sure that we tell our story better in Africa. The PEPFA story has never been told centrally. Centr what do I mean by this? When head of states gather in Addis Ababa in February, no one has stood over there and said, look, we've invested 100 billion on the continent. We've invested at, at, and they have saved at, at 20 million lives. And what our, our competitors, China, where they come in and they go to Addis Ababa and construct an $80 million uh, infrastructure as headquarters of Africa City, but everybody points to that and say, ah, you see, the Chinese have built an 80 million, 80 million, and we've invested 100 billion, and nobody is talking about, uh, about that. So because they do that centrally, they go to the AU and build a building, and then you can point to that. We have to work hard to, to change that, that, that dynamics, I mean, as, 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 much, as much as we can. All right, that's a wonderful way to end. I think that was a good response. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenga Sang, for the time. I uh, want to thank uh, all our distinguished panelists and the CFA and the Global Health Catalyst for collaborating on this. And uh, we look forward to more conversations with uh, you, John. You know, thank you for being uh, always there. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.